can we all just take a moment to realize how many death flags Takaki gave in this episode? Like, the death flags right now. Like, holy crap. I mean, Takaki going around this episode saying how nice of a life he's having, how nice of a life the Earth branch of Tekadon is having, them death flags for a lot of our characters, or the flags for unhappiness, for instance, misery, is upon us, especially with the conclusion of this episode. Takaki, you gotta stop, my boy. You're giving a lot of them flags. I mean, death flags, trauma flags, misery flags, whatever type of name you want to attach to flags. The point is, is Takaki, my boy, before everything is said and done, most likely you're probably gonna die, or your sister is probably going to die. But getting off of that, though, a political episode of Gundam. Now, I know many might not like this episode because, for one, some might prefer an action oriented episode. But if you've watched me for a long time now, you most likely know how I personally feel about political episodes, slice of life episodes, and downtime episodes. Because it's episodes like these that are very, very important to any type of series. Even an action based series, it's good to have downtime episodes that build up the drama, build up the plot, build these characters, give characterization and development, and show a different side to characters that we normally don't see. For instance, the Orga and Atra scene that we saw in this episode, normally you would look at it and think it was a waste of space, a waste of time. That's how you would view that scene. Normally, that's what you would think. Like, oh, this is filler, this ain't important really to the grand scheme of things of our characters or what this episode was about. But to be honest with you, that Atra and Orga scene was probably one of my favorites. Besides the political stuff and the main stuff going on, that was one of my favorite scenes because it showcased a side that you normally don't see from characters. For instance, them not in battle mode, them not in a serious mode to where they're ready to kick some ass or their mode to where they're doing business or doing work. That scene between Atra and Orga was kind of like a slice of life-ish moment that normally would be cut from any type of anime and never would be shown, but it was shown regardless to show a side of Orga that we don't see. For instance, him being a little bit more human, but also what happens when he's done with work and just trying to chillax and chill and what we see here is a man that's constantly pushed himself you know as we know orga he he's kind of gotten this position pushed on being you know in political or politics and stuff you know the way he's leading everyone we know this man he's doing something that he's normally not used to and he's not you know the best at he's gotten better but he's not the best at it and you see how much effort he's been putting into you know tekadon and getting everything handled and all that but you see how he's kind of just now come to terms with whatever he has in front of him he needs to deal with. He needs to eat, he needs to finish it. And that's kind of how the food was displayed. It shows that Orga, he doesn't need to have this high luxury life. He doesn't need to have everything warmed up for him like food. And just that one scene alone showcases what type of stance Orga has right now in his life. For instance, he will accept anything that comes his way. He will deal with what comes on his plate, and he will continue to go down that path that he's set out for since the beginning of Season 1. And I like that about this, you know, little interaction between Atra and him, but also what Mika was doing, too. I mean, his interaction with Orga is saying, like, hey, you know, you look a little bit slim, like you're skinnying up and all that. I think you need to get something to eat, and he throws something on his, you know, plate. I mean, a lot of people probably would think that's rather rude. I mean, in real life, I've actually had that done to me when I was in school. I remember I was like let's say eating and you would have someone throw something onto your plate because they didn't want to eat it or you, you'd throw something on their plate because you're like fuck this I don't want this shit I don't want this like you know crusty pizza that's school pizza ugh ugh hate school pizza. So, the thing was, it's just this scene, this little interaction showed a human side to these characters that you would normally never see, and I appreciate that. I really appreciate how Iron-Blooded Orphans actually showcased this little scene that normally many would, you know, dismiss and just throw outside the window off the table and think it was a piece of shit moment, but in reality, it was a good moment to showcase what type of characters they are besides just being all about the action, all about just kicking ass or, you know, being business people. That scene was really amazing. So, besides that, let's talk about the real stuff of this episode, okay? Besides that scene. So, the political stuff going on right now, it's pretty dire. Because right now, as we know, Tekadon, they're in a very good spot. They have become rather well-known. They're a well-known organization now. They've constantly had a lot of victories. They've lost a few people. But overall, though, what's going on for Tekadon right now, it's really positive. They managed to make an Earth branch. For instance, they have an organization, a part of Tekadon on Earth, which is a very good 
good thing to have. And right now, a bunch of the characters that have had a very hard life and upbringing, they're finally being able to have kind of a happier life. For instance, with their family. For instance, Takaki and his sister, she's being able to study right now on Earth, and everything is fine. And with this, the political matter going on, Tekadon on Earth is having a bad issue because there was a political move. For instance, an explosion that, uh, you know, harmed someone very high up in the political status. For instance, Ma Makanai, he got hurt by an explosion, and also you have a door of the shady trader that's working with Tekadon is starting shit, and then a war is popping up with SAU. I think that's their name, SAU, that's the organization name. So, right now we have a war starting, it's like a political war, but an actual war too, and Tekadon has been thrown in the middle of this because they have a traitor, which just leads into the next point of discussion I need to talk about. So this traitor, I, his name is like Radis? Fuck it, I want to call him Radish, okay? I'm going to call this man freaking Radish. So Radish, this man was appointed as kind of like second in command on the Earth branch of Tekadon. And the reason for this is because... Tewaz wanted him to be second in command. They forced this man in there. Now, this man also was a human debris. He, he was also, you know, pretty much similar to what Orga and Mika and all the other main characters are. He's very similar with his upbringing, but you could see that he believes he's, like, on a higher status. Like, the way you saw in this episode when he was going behind the scenes, he thought he was smarter than them. Tekadon was kind of immature, stupid children, and that's one of the things you don't, don't ever do when it comes to Tekadon. You don't think they're immature children that you can walk on top of them and just destroy them. Him. Tekadon has proven time and time again you don't underestimate them because of their age. You you know, that's a really bad thing to do. These kids, even though they're kids and they're age-wise, their maturity level and how they act, they are really far past normal maturity from people their age. So this guy is definitely underestimating Tekadon. But at this time, though, he kind of punched Tekadon in the side because they don't really expect it. And poor Chad, this man, he kind of got everything thrown on top of him. I mean, this man probably, you could see, he's having issues on, you know, really controlling the Earth branch. You know, this man was forced on top of him to be second in command, and he has to have this man second in command since Taywas put him and appointed him as second in command. So you know Chad's having it rough. And then Takaki, he's trying to calm down all the new recruits and everybody to make sure they're fine and they don't go off the rails and start shit. So, I mean, overall, I understand why this man was appointed second in command, why Radish was, because they were kind of forced. Chad had to deal with that, but also Orga, too, he probably put that there and, you know, didn't really fight against it. So, overall, I feel bad for the Earth Branch right now because it's kind of, in a way, Orga's fault for probably appointing this guy and probably being completely fine with it and not really doing nothing about it. So, yeah, which leads to the problem in this episode. Now, at this time, though, we don't know if Chad and Makanai are dead. That's not really confirmed in this episode because we don't see them. I mean, it's stated multiple times after the explosion that they're unconscious, they're injured, but they're unconscious, but they're not dead. But we don't actually get to see them in this episode. And through half of the episode, we know the dude that's feeding us this information is a traitor. He's a liar. And so we don't really know what is going on in that point of the episode. We don't know if Makanai or Chad is dead. For all we know, they could already be dead, but they're just saying that he's injured because they just want to build up the suspense, but also hold these cards against Tekadon and everyone else. So, that is the question I have right now. Is Chad and Makanai dead, or are they alive, but, you know, unconscious and injured? Now, next thing to talk about, let's talk about SAU. So, SAU is starting a war. They want a war, and it's relatively bad, because, I mean, this puts, you know, Gullahorn, some factions of Gullahorn, you know, for instance, the Chocolate Man in a bad state, but also it puts Tekadon in a bad state as well. The repercussions of this is rather negative. And so they need to figure out a way out of this of how they can kind of correct the issue and probably negate this war. Because, you know, going in, you know, guns blazing is not always the correct answer. It isn't. Sometimes you got to sit down and talk with the individual party to be able to overcome any issue that's in your way. But most likely it's going to come to some form of battle, but sometimes it's better to kind of negotiate instead of trying to start a war and I see Orga and maybe the chocolate man trying to do this before everything is said and done now Moving past that, let's talk about one last thing. Let's talk about Kudelia. So Kudelia, she's entering the fray. She has changed her outfit. She's going to where Mach and I was. And this is good because that means Kudelia is now going to be with our main cast traveling along with them. And I can't wait to see more of her character throughout this season. Because, I mean, she got a lot of development at the end of Season 1. And I want to see where her development goes in Season 2. Because she's a really good character. She's very strong-willed. And I just loved her at the end of Season 1 and seeing how much she just progressed. 
best. I just cannot wait to see what she does now for the remainder of Season 2. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. You all have a wonderful day or night wherever you live. Please be safe. I love you all so much. Chibi out.